Welcome to an advanced clinical care tutorial. This series of tutorials will cover aspects of caring for patients with complicated HIV and TB disease in Department of Health facilities in South Africa, compiled by the NICD and the National Department of Health and facilitated by Dr. Madeleine Muller, Clinical Advisor for Beyond Zero. This is module four of eight modules on the prevention, identification and management of cryptococcal meningitis. This module will cover key aspects of how to confirm the diagnosis of cryptococcal disease. To confirm your suspicions of cryptococcal meningitis is relatively easy. Perform a lumbar puncture on all patients with suspected CM and submit the CSF to the laboratory for investigation. But which diagnostic test should be requested on the cerebral spinal fluid to diagnose cryptococcal meningitis? There are several ways to test for cryptococcal meningitis, and we will look at three common methodologies. There are a couple of rapid tests, and the first is the traditional India ink stain. This is not automated and is looked at by a technician. The background is stained, so we call it a negative stain, and the yeasts with the recognizable large capsules become visible. But the Indian ink test is technician dependent and you can get false positives if it is confused with, for example, candida, which is a bit more oval, or artifacts such as bubbles. So it's a good test if it's positive. It has a high specificity, but it can miss 20% in best case scenarios, or even more with a sensitivity of only 20 to 80%. It also may pick up dead yeast and therefore it does not confirm live infection. The second rapid test is the cryptococcal antigens test, which has a high specificity and sensitivity, more than 95%, so always requested. It may also pick up dead yeast and is therefore not great at monitoring patients already on treatment. The cryptococcal antigen test is a lateral flow assay and takes the lab only 10 minutes to do. It looks similar to an HIV test. There is a tip on the strip that you dip into any type of blood as well as CSF. All NHLS CD4 laboratories in South Africa are currently being equipped to do the CRAG on blood samples submitted for CD4 if the CD4 is under 100. Last but not least is your traditional culture. You can only grow crypto on a culture if you have live organisms, so it's the only test that can confirm live infection. It is positive within 72 hours, but it's not routinely done as it's best to compare two different samples over a period of time. As you can test drug sensitivity on it, it is only of use if you suspect antimicrobial resistance. So let us continue with our case of Mr. ZZ who has presented ill and continue with our investigations. In this patient, all three tests were performed and he was Indian ink positive, CRAG positive, and they even cultured the organism. Do note that it is possible to have cryptococcal meningitis by a negative blood CRAG. That is because of the fungal load in the blood. The volume of antigen affects the ability for the sample to flow across the strip and yield a positive result. Very important. When you do your LP and you suspect cryptococcal meningitis, remember to do an opening pressure. First ensure that there is no focal neurological deficits. The only exception is the sixth nerve pulses, which are actually caused by the uniform increase of intracranial pressure and the LP will actually be therapeutic. If there are focal deficits, perform a head CT scan to rule out space occupying lesions. A lumbar puncture not only identifies high intracranial pressure, but it is also therapeutic. It has been shown that managing high intracranial pressure improves the prognosis. Up to 75% of patients with cryptococcal meningitis will have an increased intracranial pressure, and 15% of patients can get an increased pressure on treatment even when clearing infection. A small percentage of patients have persistently raised intracranial pressure, and some may need a shunt. The increased pressure is caused by a CSF outflow obstruction and may be present at diagnosis or later during treatment. It is the main cause of most of the classic CM symptoms as outlined in the previous module. So 
So how do you measure the pressure in a rural facility that are not able to order manometers? And what is a normal intracranial pressure? The pressure must be measured in the left lateral position and try to avoid excessive spinal flexion. You may have to begin with the patient sitting upright and then lay them down when ready to measure the pressure. Try and get your hospital to order manometers, but it is fairly effective to use a drip administration set. As soon as you see the pushback of fluid, you connect the lure adapter to your cannula. Keep the roller clamp closed, hold the drip set upright, and measure the vertical column of CSF as it pushes up the tubing. How much fluid should be removed? And here is a simple guide. If opening pressure is more than 25 centimeters water, remove 10 to 30 moles CSF to reduce the pressure by at least 50% or to less than 20 centimeters water. Important, repeat the lumbar puncture whenever there are signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure. Some patients may need daily LPs to keep symptoms under control. Tapping CSF in patients with increased pressure is more effective than analgesia. The patient feels better and it has shown to also improve the prognosis. In summary, to diagnose cryptococcal meningitis is relatively simple. Send a CSF for CRAG and NDAM. But always remember to measure the intracranial pressure when doing a lumbar puncture for patients who have suspected cryptococcal meningitis. Thank you.